Hi, this is a video about um, giving an overview about a model for contextual learning and teaching uh, for reasoning. And uh, you'll see that uh, it is a model that comes from a textbook. Uh, and I think that later in this, um, in one of the later modules, you'll have actually have a copy of the textbook. The purpose of this module is just to give you an overview of uh, of an approach to learning and teaching and that is that is fit and remember this is this entire module uh this overview module is a uh is it what we call a global before local uh which is a which is another kind of way of saying i'm going to give you the big picture before i give you this in, in small pieces so anyway this is about a model from a book and, and uh, it is about um, uh, giving you uh, uh, some information about um, teaching for critical thinking. Uh, it requires uh, a bit of um, skepticism among uh, um, students and scholars. Uh, we all are skeptics as scholars. Uh, so it, call, it involves calling into question the assumptions of the, uh, underlying our customary and habitual ways of thinking and acting, and then being ready to think and act differently on the basis of This is a model that um, uh, has um, uh, four um, elements to it, and it um, uh, it's a circular model that has um, places where you can begin at at any kind of uh, place with any one of these key elements, and it, and of course situated is about context. So it, um, one of the elements is about authentic context. Uh, the other is about uh, teaching in in a constructive uh, constructivist format where we're constructing new knowledge in our understanding and and by a dialectical in, in, uh, engagement between the, uh, uh, the student and uh, instructor um, and then uh, the other pieces are involved in instructional practices that uh, encourage students to articulate what they've learned and to reflect on it and the reflection is for meaning, a reasoning, and implications for practice. You've probably heard me talk about that. And again, I'll refer back to it. It's a circular model. And I can begin my uh, instruction with in a context or with a, um, uh, a reflective practice or um, by getting students to tell me what, uh, in what they know, which is a form of articulation of knowledge. So uh, it's in a non-directional circle, as you can see. Um, it's about systematic reflection, co-construction knowledge, and shared experiences in authentic context. So here's the model itself. Uh, I can choose to begin with shared experiences. Uh, this would have, have students in the real world. In this case, I have you in Iceland, and uh, this is a field of lupine behind me in the mountains on the uh, north side of the island of Iceland. Or we could talk about uh, uh, some kind of uh, discussion with regards to what does this topic mean to you? What, uh, and uh, and then evolved into how do we be, how do we think about it? how do we draw conclusions and what do, and then uh, we can begin uh, an instructional practice where we begin to think about co-construction of knowledge and then give students the opportunity to say what they have learned and we can do that in a variety of ways in a in a written paper or a video or a, uh, a number of different kinds of ways for students to express what it is that they have, uh, what they've learned. So this is the basic model. So let's start with shared experiences in authentic context here. Learning has a context. It's all, and uh, we haven't really gotten into studying context yet, but if, you, if you'll recall, um, one of the things about uh, uh, that we know about context is that everybody comes to the learning at a learning event with a different interpretation of the context so if even if we're out in the real world where we all think we understand um, uh, a similar kind of 
uh, understanding about uh, the nature of the context, we find that everybody has different experiences and they interpret context differently. And so um, we come to understand context as, a, as both an individual and a collective thing. So um, the, uh, what, we, what we found over the years is that if we teach th uh, things in an abstract way, the knowledge can be recalled and, um, and given in the form of an exam, for example. Uh, but it is not always necessarily applied well in the, in the real world. But what we find if we teach it in the real world, if we teach math um, uh, in the form of fluid pressure uh, uh, um, equations uh, at, a, at a waterfall in Maine, uh, those the, that information is going to have life to it, and it's going to be able to be extended beyond the classroom. And we'll refer to that as learning transfer, and that's going to be an issue that we'll talk about quite a lot during the semester. So, um, but context can be arrayed for our purposes of teaching. It can be arrayed from abstract to an authentic setting. So let's let's look at what we what we talk about in terms of uh, uh, abstraction. So here here is a continuum. I'm not a big fan of continuums, but this is a this is a way of, um, of at least illustrating what I mean. Context uh, classroom based abstracts and settings <coughs> are on one end of the continuum, and real authentic um, uh, settings are set on the other. This would be real life. Uh, out here this would be what we talk about real life but it's it's really kind of a, uh, open to interpretation for everybody if we're in real life everybody sees the same thing at the real time at, in, in real time and in um, and as together as a group <coughs> pardon me sometimes it's not practical to be out in the field uh, with students but that's the that's the uh, the best thing that we can do is to be out in the real field. But sometimes uh, simulated instructional context and settings are things we have to, we have to do. That's a, that's a compromise. So um, that's, um, th there's a continuum here of, of authenticity. Um, I, I believe in, in most of the research that we're looking at for this, this entire semester is that the further we are out towards authentic context, the more viable learning is, the more uh, lively it is, and um, the students engage in it uh, more, the more authentic it is. And there's lots of research that can back that up. So let me take a step back to my... Um, and um, so that, that's, a, that's a little bit of a discussion with regards to the importance of, of having shared experience in an authentic context. Or if we can't be in authentic context, uh, as close to a simulation as we can. But the, the big thing is whenever we can, if we can avoid this kind of um, uh, teacher in front of a theater style, um, where students are waiting for us to tell them everything that we know, rather than engaging in a conversation, which is a good, um, uh, so let's move on now to, to say that we're over here in the circle now, where we're talking about teachers and learning, uh, teachers and learning co-constructing knowledge. Um, here, we're, we're going back to the assumption that learning is social in nature. And again, that's the whole foundation of what we're talking about this semester is that we're not, we're not necessarily talking about uh, the psychology between the years for this, this semester. But we're, we're saying that learning is a social phenomenon. And it's, uh, uh, it's also based on prior learning. And that goes back to the, what we were talking about, how people interpret context because the interpretation of context is based on prior um, on prior learning and in prior experiences that are accumulated in prior learning. 
So we also found out that, that communities are uh, foundational to, uh, to learning and that uh, social constructivism applies here. Now, what we're talking about social constructivism is that we're talking about a form of teaching and it's based on dialogue. It's called dialectical constructivism. And um, um, dialectical constructivism is a fancy word for saying it's a conversation. So it's uh, by conversation, it's it's a it's a way that teachers engage in conversation with students. That's two way, and that through that two way, as we come to a common understanding of uh, of the of the nature of the knowledge, and that it is not always. Um, Teaching the old things new, but it's kind of a reconstruction of things that we that that we know as a group, and that goes back to that issue of the, of the social nature of learning. So the common teaching methods here are often you find people modeling in this condition, where you know where you say, "Well, let me show you how to do one," and then and then you do one. So it, you know it's kind of model and then uh, do one. Um, oftentimes there's scaffolding and fading where uh, uh, you, you would uh, teach something up to a point where the student doesn't have any capability and the student and then the teacher would say let me scaffold you over that and let me show you how to do this next part and then let the student pick it up and move from there and then as they become more knowledgeable we fade from that that's called scaffolding and fading and uh, you'll see that methodology uh, quite, um, quite a lot. Uh, later on, we're going to connect that up with Vygotsky's uh, theories of development and zones of proximal development. Um, the other, um, other thing that uh, is, a, is a common teaching method is, is let's, let's explore. Let's not just say what it is. But let, let's go out into the real world and let's explore things and let's, let's reason our way to uh, an understanding here. Now, when I say exploration, I'm not talking about a teacher just saying, you can, you guys just go explore things and come back and tell me what you learned. But let's explore, let's explore together within bounds so that we're not wasting a lot of time of trying to just uh, understand, uh, just um, uh, have, have hundreds and hundreds of experiences, but let's, let's focus the, ex the exploration. But exploration is a really good thing, and, and it opens the door to a lot of creativity. So a next aspect of the model is that we, um, and we might move, I'm just going to move back, up, go back a step. Let's, we might move to this, this phase of the model, and I'm just sort of going around clockwise here, but I could go this way or that way or this way or this way or across or up or down or over. But, now, but right now we're talking about, let's let students articulate their knowledge. And the underlying assumptions here is that, uh, that uh, multiple uses of information could uh, promotes growth of mental frameworks. And it's those mental frameworks that are pulled together to create a bigger picture. And, and those are the, uh, the kind of mental frameworks that we were talking about that helps people interpret content. Well, uh, the assumptions are that teachers validate the accuracy of the concept learned. So if we're out learning for ourselves and the, and the student comes in and says, this is, this is, this is what uh, you and I have, have constructed and I'm presenting it back to you and the teacher then has a chance to say, well, okay, that's great, uh, but here's, here's, a, here's a little twist. So those are, the, those are the two big assumptions here where we're getting students to articulate what it is they know. So we're going to go back to the teaching methods. And again, we're talking about exploration in terms of guided and focused uh, uh, discussion and, and people talk aloud. Uh, again, we go back to our old trend of modeling teachers. You want to do one and talk about it. Um, and then get students to articulate with a variety of expressions. You can get them to articulate in oral, written, video, theatrical, lots of different kinds of uh, kinds of, uh, of, of formats. But that's that's part of this uh, of this model. And then we move to uh, shared reflections for meaning, reasoning, 
and the trash was mud top in, in my writing, and you'll see when you read, read the book chapter. But I refer to this as uh, uh, systematic reflection. So I'm, I'm really interested in meaning making. How did you come to that conclusion, and what does it mean for your practice? Now, here, um, here in the the, uh, the assumption of this is that the mental uh, frameworks are shaped by experiences, values, and, and cultural things that you can and that you can learn uh, for it. Uh, the, the, the reflection is from meaning making, and our brains are meaning makers. That, that's the human function of the brains. It's how we live, it's how we survive. Is it, is it we, when we engage in an experience, we try to, we immediately try to make meaning. And students who um, engage in something new or their brains are trying to make sense of it. And if it's too far in that abstraction, it's too hard to make meaning. And, and so that's one of the reasons that we don't get active learning from classroom-based things often, because students don't really see how it makes meaning in their lives. And the, the results in that old, the age old question of, when am I ever gonna do this in life? And um, that's a really interesting uh, uh, question that, st that students often ask. And I believe that we deserve an a they deserve an answer to that. And I think an illustration of it is by putting them in an exact context. Um, so it's, um, it's, it's meaning making, it's reflection in action, it's reflection as you do things, and then it's reflection on action. What did we do? And then it's about reason. How did we come to these conclusions? What is there a, uh, about this that gives us evidence for belief of what we're doing that supports a reason? So what is the, uh, when, when we track back and ask students about what mental processes did you use that come to a conclusion, get them to think about the elements that they used to how did you put this idea with this idea and draw that conclusion? And as a result, the, the, the other kind of thing that, that we can do that enriches that is to say, how, what, what, what kind of evidence do you have to support your conclusion? The, the other thing then is how good is your evidence? There's lots of people that will use evidence. I mean, you can, you can say, uh, I saw something on CNN, that's my evidence. Well, is CNN always right? Is CNN biased? Is CNN not biased? So it, it's, open to, it's open to interpretation. So what is the quality of the evidence? And as scholars, we do, we do systematic research. And we look at the research, we say, what is the quality of the research? So there's this, there's this as, you, as, you, as you go through your your um, academic life, the part of the growth there is how to interpret research and understand this is good research and this is good evidence as opposed to evidence that's not quite as solid as this is. And then of course the last part of that reflection is, is about expert practice. What are, um, as you develop those, um, as a reflector you will gain stages of expertise. And uh, we'll talk a lot more about the development of expertise. So once again, we go back to the teaching methods of exploration and a reflection on a variety of learning out, uh, activities. So um, you'll see as we go along, we'll talk more about these teaching methods as we, as we get deeper into the method. But again, this is just an overview. This is just a way to begin to begin the conversation about a theoretical underpinning for learning and teaching in a situated environment. Okay, what are the implications for practice? All this research suggests more likely use of applied knowledge when learned in authentic context and, and settings. So the, the realer, the better. If you can make things as real to students, they're more likely to use and apply the knowledge
in a variety of settings. Increased likelihood of learning transfer. Now we haven't talked about uh, learning transfer uh, yet, but we, we will have a long discussion about learning transfer. And that is, uh, basically a, a learning transfer is the application of information that I learned here to solve a problem over there. Now there's all kinds of uh, problems but, uh, with learning transfer in, in trying to understand does the transfer occur, does it not occur? And there's a lot of different kinds of transfer, but if, on a simple level, what, what, we're, what we're looking for is students to be able to use the knowledge that they learned in this setting to solve a problem in um, a different setting. Now, the, the closer the settings are, the more likely they are to be able to use the information. But if the contexts are completely different, and that's what we begin to call far transfer, the first is near transfer, the other is far transfer, it gets much more difficult. And you'll find that students don't transfer information easily. Um, we find that all the time in student teaching, with you know, in, in classes and uh, uh, methods classes, for example, and all those kind of things. We teach undergraduates, and and you guys as master students are getting certification. We'll teach you about methods, and then when you apply them in the real world, and we ask you and ask you about it, you say, "Well, you never taught me that." Well, yeah, we did, but it didn't transfer. Um, the other implication for practice from this from this model is that we're more likely to get uh, student engagement and motivation, and <laughs> and when and once we get student engagement and motivation, we're more likely to see adaptation of higher levels of reasoning and higher levels of practice, which is really the purpose of of all of this situated learning. It's about Criti uh, about critical thinking and being able to be more proficient sooner. So that's a that's a quick overview of a model, and and, and we're going to talk about this model in greater, much greater depth uh, a little bit later in the semester. But I wanted to give it to you now so that you would have uh, a little bit of information uh, about it, uh, particularly as you're beginning to think about uh, the design of your projects and the kind of work that you're going to be doing. So that is um, um, where we are um, now. And uh, so um, thanks again for uh, watching this recording and we'll uh, move on to the next topic in the module.